Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 60-minute webinar series of the International College of Surgeons United States section. I am your host, Dr. Rob Amadroy. I'm a colorectal surgeon here in the Heartland in Kansas City, Missouri. March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Colorectal cancer is a cancer that is very preventable. The key word there is very. In collaboration with the members of the Society of Colorectal Surgeons and our wonderful guest speaker, Dr. Fala May, we will discuss some of the important and current topics on colorectal cancer. Today, we will discuss a very important topic, colorectal cancer in young patients, the incidence and the recommendations, and that will be followed by the surgical management of rectal cancer, and then we conclude with another hot topic, colorectal cancer immunotherapy. We will have a question and answer at the end of the presentations. Please post your questions in the chat box and our staff will collate these accordingly. Our first speaker is Dr. Fala May. Dr. May is a gastroenterologist and comes to us from UCLA Health System as the Director of the Quality and Improvement at UCLA Health. I have heard her talk extensively on importance of colorectal cancer screening. She and her team do major research on healthcare disparity and her team recently received a whopping $8 million grant uh, for that effort. She will be speaking on the incidence of colorectal cancer in young patients the incidents and the recommendations. Dr. Fala May. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. Uh, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on what part of the world you're in. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Dr. Fola May. I'm a gastroenterologist and health services researcher at UCLA Health and in the VA. And the title of my talk is Colorectal Cancer in Young Adults, Incidents and Recommendations. Next slide, please. These are my disclosures. Colorectal cancer is common and deadly, but largely preventable. It is the number three most common cancer in men and women in the United States. And when you look at cancer-related deaths, it actually rises to the number two most common cause of cancer-related deaths. Even though this cancer is largely preventable with, screen with screening, one in three adults in the United States are not screened for colorectal cancer. And that rate for unsc un unscreened is actually higher in racial and ethnic minorities. Next slide. Back one slide, please. Okay. When we look at the overall incidence and mortality from colorectal cancer, we see differences by race and ethnicity. These here are data from the North American Association of Central Cancer Registries. It's a cancer registry, so data from around the United States of America. And when we look at incidence and mortality from colorectal cancer by race and ethnicity, we see differences. Black individuals are uh, noted here by the light blue bars, or the medium colored blue bars, I should say. And also we represent Asian, I mean, um, American Indian Alaska Natives by the lighter blue bar. And as you can see on the incidence columns, we have the highest incidence of colorectal cancer in, in American Indian Alaska Natives, followed by, by Black individuals. And when you look at deaths from colorectal cancer, there's a similar trend. So unfortunately, this disease is disproportionately impacting Black individuals and American Indian Alaska Natives in the United States. Next slide. Overall, over time, we have seen improvements in deaths and, and cases of colorectal cancer over time. So this here is data from the SEER program. When you look at individuals of all ages, those numbers are always coming down, whether you're looking at Black individuals, white individuals, Hispanic individuals, and whether you're looking at incidence or mortality. Next slide. However, when we look at incidents in individuals who are under age 50, we see a very different trend than we see in individuals who are over age 50. These are important charts that were released by the American Cancer Society in a very recent publication. I wanna draw your attention first to the right side of the screen, looking at individuals who are 65 years and older. When we look at cases of colorectal cancers and men and women in this age group, all of those rates are coming down in our older Americans. This is representing the effectiveness of screening. We're most likely to screen people when they're over 65 and it's working. But now I wanna draw your attention to the left side of the screen, looking at incidents in individuals individuals who are age 20 to 49, and those rates are going up. And that is what we are very concerned about in the changing landscape and the epidemiology of this disease. Next slide. 
When we look at young adults in the United States, we actually have seen a 51% increase in the number of cases of colorectal cancer since the year 1994. Even more concerning than that, when we look at projections from deaths from all types of cancers in this country, colorectal cancer is actually projected to be the number one cause of cancer-related deaths in individuals aged 20 to 49 by the year 2030. So in just about seven short years, this is gonna be the number one cancer killer in young adults. Next slide. This incidence, when we look at early onset colorectal cancer or EOCRC, also varies by race and ethnicity. This data again comes from SEER, which is a cancer registry. Black individuals are represented by the purple line and the diamonds on the top bar, and white individuals are represented by the green line with the, with the green open triangles just below that. I wanna draw your attention to the years 2014 to 17. You can see here there's a dramatic change in the number of cases in white individuals, again, represented by the green line, in which those number of cases in white individuals have actually almost surpassed the number of cases we see in black individuals. So although we have these big differences in incidence overall looking at all ages, when you look at um, cases by race, ethnicity, uh, and when you look at early onset subunits, we actually are seeing that white individuals are actually catching up to black individuals. Next slide. So this is the basis for why the United States Preventive Service Task Force changed the recommendations for colorectal cancer screening in May of 2021. They made two commissioned reports, both are published one was a systematic review to look at the benefits and harms of screening young adults. And the second was a set of modeling studies from CISNET, which they've worked with for several years that look at life years gained, cases, deaths, colonoscopy burden, and harms at different starting ages. So they looked at starting screening at age 30, 35, 40, 45, and they tried to see what would be most effective as a population health approach. Next slide. What they found is that it will be effective to screen younger adults. And that led the United States Preventive Task Force to start with a new set of recommendations, making a grade A or highly recommended uh, guideline to screen individuals 50 to 75, but also adding a grade B recommendation to screen individuals who are 45 to 49. So since May of 2021, we have had this guidance that we should start screening earlier at age 45. Next slide. The United States Preventive Task Force recommends many different modalities for screening. Up here, I'm highlighting the stool-based screening strategies. These include high sensitivity FOBT, the fecal immunochemical test are fit, and stool DNA fit, otherwise known as Cologuard. Next slide. The important thing to note about these non-colonoscopic screening tests is that they are two-step strategies. So if you have an abnormal non-colonoscopic screening test, you must recognize that those with a positive result or an abnormal result have to have a colonoscopy to, to complete the screening process. And we have this challenge in the United States with a lot of people getting a fit or a cologuard, having a positive result and not getting that diagnostic colonoscopy that's warranted. Next slide. I also want to highlight that we have direct visualization techniques for the colon for colorectal cancer screening. These include CT colonography, flexible sigmoidoscopy, and colonoscopy. Colonoscopy having the broadest um, span only every 10 years for people who have a normal result. Next slide. Uh, again, highlighting here the strategies for screening. So individuals who are 45 and above can pick any of these strategies. And the USPFTF really wanted to highlight this, that it doesn't matter which of these seven strategies you pick, the most important thing is that you get it done. So I have patients who I describe these strategies to, and they some of them pick colonoscopy, some of them pick FIT, some of them pick Cologuard. It doesn't matter. The best test is the one the patient's actually going to complete. Next slide. The exception to that is our high-risk population. High-risk groups are people who've had a personal history of tubular adenomas or of colorectal cancer, or a family history of colorectal cancer or tubular adenomas, also those with ulcerative colitis or long-standing Crohn's disease, 
these individuals should not choose one of the non-colonoscopic screening tests. They first of all should be seen regularly by a gastroenterologist and they should be screened and surveilled only with colonoscopy. So typically you wanna ask people, do they have one of these conditions? And then those who are saying yes, you wanna uh, push to colonoscopy, everybody else you wanna give those ever, other options of the seven strategies. Next slide. Despite the fact that we've got seven strategies for screening, strong evidence that screening works, and USPFTF guidelines for screening, participation is very low in the United States. When you look at the NHIS, which is a national telephone survey, the most recent data is from 2021, only 59% of Americans are screened for colorectal cancer. It varies widely by state, very low in my state of California, a little bit higher in states like Massachusetts or the District of Columbia at 70%, but still far below the goal of having you know, upwards of 80, 90, 100% of our population screened for this highly preventable disease. Next slide. So I'll, I'll wrap up here. Um, the main points that I want to make is that colorectal cancer is common and deadly, but largely preventable with screening, yet participation is low. What I'm saying here is that a lot of people don't even recognize how common colorectal cancer is. Certainly people don't recognize this new epidemiologic trend that it's going to be the number one cancer killer in young adults by the year 2030. So we need to spread that message and we need to get people more aware, especially young adults. My second most important point here is that colorectal cancer rates have been decreasing overall, but increasing in individuals under age 50 since the 1990s. So again, this is the epidemic that we call in our field of early onset colorectal cancer. It is a challenge. It is why we changed the screening guidelines, but we still have millions of people who are unscreened. Screening should begin at age 45 now for average risk individuals. Um, so again, since May 2021, that is the guidance from the United States Preventive Task Force. And as I showed, we're not doing a great job of that. So we've got a lot of work to do, especially in young adults. And the high risk groups, I'll also highlight again that those individuals often will start screening even earlier or more frequently. So those people need to be under the guidance of a professional who knows about those screening guidelines. And the last thing I want to say is that um, there are several screening modalities. We've really moved away from recommending only colonoscopy. We really need to move towards telling people that there are many options. There are gonna be a lot of patients who are not interested in a colonoscopy, are very hesitant, distrustful of the healthcare system. So we need to recognize that there are very simple tests that patients can do in the comfort of their own home. And the best test is the test that gets done. Next slide. I just wanna recognize uh, my team and colleagues and our funding sources that allow us to do this work. I'm also providing here um, the website for the May Lab at UCLA, where we do research in colorectal cancer screening and disparities. Thank you very much for your time. Excellent, excellent talk, Dr. May. Um, you are watching the 60 minute webinar series of the International College of Surgeons, United States Sections. This is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. And today we are discussing some of the important topics in colorectal cancer. You just heard Dr may have uh, do a great talk here if you're joining us we are collecting questions in the chat box for the q a session our next speaker is dr easy obohari a colorectal surgeon at the texas tech health sciences center in amarillo texas dr amarillo is a doctor so dr obohari is a very good friend of mine uh, doing great work in texas he will be presenting to us uh, surgical management of rectal cancer well, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amadjoy, for the introduction. And so today I'll be talking about the surgical management of rectal cancer. Next slide. Um, true separate in Texas, uh, which um, helps pr uh, prevent colon cancer. Next slide. The objective today is to understand the steps to evaluate patients with rectal cancer the non-surgical options for rectal cancer management, and of course, the surgical management for rectal cancer, as well as the pitfalls to avoid when taking care of patients with rectal cancer. Uh, by way of background, they're about, so annually, about 40, 42,000 people are diagnosed with um, rectal cancer, and approximately 85,000 die from rectal cancer annually. 
So rectal cancer occurs in the upper, middle, or lower rectum. And the rectum for most people is approximately about 15 to 20 centimeters long, depending on how tall the person is. But it's very crucial to identify the location of the rectal cancers, so that helps you with treatment. Next slide. So patients usually present with symptoms like abdominal pain, tenesmus, which is the feeling of incomplete evacuation. They also have severe anorectal pain, but more, more commonly, most patients are sent to a surgeon because of hemorrhoids, but they usually have rectal cancer or anal cancer, which is a different pathology. They may also have prolapsing anal mass or other symptoms, which are vague. Next slide. The patient workup includes um, a complete history and physical examination, and of course, a digital rectal examination. That is very crucial because it helps to define the anatomy of the, of the tumor, the distance from the anal verge, the mobility, if it's fixed or if it's, if it's mobile. Um, it also tells you if it's nodular as well. It, it can also tell you if the tumor invades surrounding structures like the uterus, the prostate. Um, and this can also determine if a patient would require a temporary or permanent colostomy at the end, and if the sphincter is functional. But the first step is to make sure the patient gets a colonoscopy and a rigid proctoscopy. Next slide. So a rigid proctoscopy is very crucial for the diagnosis of rectal cancer because it helps with the accurate management. As you can see on the top left slide, the patient gets a colonoscopy and is measured at approximately 20 centimeters. But when you lift the gluteal folds, you can see it's about 15 centimeters. However, on anoscopy, the tumor is actually about 10 centimeters from the anal verge. So the accurate measurement, it's best done using um, the rigid proctoscope. Next slide. And in, in addition to that, you want to also do a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis for complete staging. A PET CT scan can be done as well if there's any question about metastatic disease. Um, a CA level is obtained. Uh, for my, all my patients, I get an MRI as well as endorectal ultrasound, which I perform myself. It's done with a, a 10 to um, a 10 megahertz probe. Next slide. Now, when it comes to the advantage of endorectal ultrasound, the endorectal ultrasound is very crucial for identifying structures and identifying invasion around the prostate. Next slide. It can also tell you if you have lymph nodes. There are different options of ultrasound. There's the 2D version, there's a 3D version. In my practice, I, I do have the 2D version available. It can also help to identify lymph nodes. Next slide. In addition to that, it also tells you if you have invasion of surrounding structures. However, when it comes to MRI, which is considered the gold standard for management of uh, or for, for staging uh, patients that have rectal cancer, it has a larger field of view. It is less operator dependent. And the accuracy is about 50 to 95% accurate, depending on the modality used on, on, under the MRI. And there are different options. There's the surface um, MRI, there's the endorectal coil, and the double contrast. For my practice, uh, for most hospitals, they have the surface MRI available. But the endorectal um, MRI has been shown to give increased um, uh, um, accuracy when it comes to diagnosis of rectal cancer. Next slide. It also tells you if you have mesorectal lymph nodes or threatened uh, mesorectal fascia. Next slide. Now, when it comes to getting a patient ready for surgery, this is crucial. Every patient that has um, rectal cancer that requires surgical intervention undergoes chemotherapy if it's, advanced, uh, if it's a locally advanced disease, chemotherapy and radiation. And after the chemotherapy and radiation, if they undergo the long course treatment, they require restaging. So for my patients, I recommend having the staging restaging done about eight weeks after the initial chemo radiation therapy. Uh, because there are some patients that actually have complete response to radiation therapy. For those patients, they go into the watch and wait arm, which has been shown to be very useful in, in saving um, the, the anal sphincter and increasing bowel continuity. But for patients that require surgery, on the left side of, this, of the screen, they require a mechanical bowel prep and an oral antibiotic bowel prep. In addition to that, the patients are re-stratified, they are sent to the cardiologist and optimized as much as possible. For my patients, I focus on the prehabilitation to make sure that they are strong enough to undergo surgery by encouraging their nutrition and improving their uh, overall outcomes. 
And in addition, you want to make sure that they are on the enhanced recovery after surgery protocol called the ERAS to enhance early discharge. Ostomy education stats in the office. The patients are fitted with a bag and sent home with a bag before surgery is done. Um, next slide. The current staging system is based on the AJC staging system, which is based on the tumor, lymph node, and metastatic um, lesions. Next slide. So patients have to be staged properly. For stage one, they could undergo uh, a local resection, such as a transanal minimal invasive surgery called TAMIS or TEMS. Uh, for patients with more advanced disease, they may require a low anterior resection, or if it's very close to the sphincter, they may require an ultra low with a hand sewn or staple anastomosis. And these patients usually get a colostomy as well. Now for patients with obstruction, they may require a stent placed. They may require fecal diversion with a colostomy or an abdominal perineal resection. For patients with locally advanced disease invading the bladder or the uterus, they may require a pelvic exoneration. Now for patients with metastatic disease, what we may end up doing is just palliative resection if they have obstruction or bleeding. Uh, the TME is the key point, the key takeaway for talking about colorectal cancer or, or rectal surgery. The TME excision is the total mesorectal excision. And this involves a, side, a sharp, precise dissection around the mesorectal plane to take the entire mesentery and intact with the lymph nodes and the blood supply. And this was really championed by Bill Heald. Next slide. And um, Bill Heald... Um, uh, in, in the early in the early uh, 80s, proposed the the treatment for rectal cancer, which will involve um, taking the entire mesorectal envelope. Prior to that, Miles uh, uh, kind of talked about uh, doing an APR in in the early 1900s. But when it comes to rectal cancer surgery, the key point is number one, taking away the cancer, and then number two, restoring continuity. So in that in that regards. But Bill Heald has been a champion and has really changed the management for rectal cancer as we know it. Next slide. When it comes to, this is a sample of what is what a, uh, the total mesorectal envelope should look like after it is done for patients. Next slide. Now, what are the pros and cons of a TME? A, a TME has a lower rate of recurrence of about four to six percent, as opposed to the previous uh, blunt dissection and traumatic risk removal of the rectum, which had a recurrence rate of about fourteen to forty percent. It has less bleeding because we're respecting the, the vascular envelope around the rectum. It has decreased bladder dysfunction, uh, but the, the cons include it takes longer, and of course there's a, there's a slightly increased uh, leak rate when it comes to this particular. Uh, treatment. Next slide. This is what it looks like when it, with, the, with the TME, uh, the incorrect way of doing the surgery versus the correct way. You can see the dotted line taken around the mesorectal envelope. Next slide. Open surgery is an option for patients. Um, this involves, um, you know, a, a long midline incision. However, the laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery, next slide, uh, actually has a better um, view and it's actually, uh, it helps with patients with early recovery, with early discharge. Next slide. So laparoscopic surgery, as you can see, the incisions are smaller. And this patient is, uh, this is a picture of a patient post-op. Next slide. When it comes to reconstruction, the question is, how low can you go? Um, and what options do you have? Do you want to do an APR versus a coloanal anastomosis or a colorectal anastomosis? A patient with a, with a, a male with a narrow pelvis and who is morbidly obese, of course, would be more challenging than a, a, a female with a smaller body size and with a wider uh, pelvic uh, brim. Incontinence, of course, has to be discussed. Um, the uh, length of the inner canal, uh, but the key point is to get to prepare based on the patient. There is no um, one size fits all mentality when it comes to rectal cancer. The treatment has to be individualized. Next slide. Uh, creating a reservoir is also, also another option or a colostomy. Next slide. For patient positioning, um, it's very crucial to position the patient properly. They're, they're placed in modified lithotomy position and um, to prevent uh, any uh, ischemic injuries to the extremities. 
And for laparoscopic surgery, these are some of the instruments we use. Next slide. When it comes to um, patient um, trocar placements, the trocars can be placed wherever the surgeon is used to, but this is the, 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 the system I use for laparoscopic and robotic surgery. Next slide. Now, the advantage of robotic surgery, of course, is the increased dexterity and the enhanced field of view. Next slide. Uh, the hand, you have about more degrees of motion as well. Next slide. The steps of protectomy include, number one, dividing the IMA, mobilization of the sigmoid colon and rectum, doing the pelvic dissection, and of course, the rectal transection, reconstruction, and the ostomy creation. The surgery may take up to about four to six hours, depending on, on the diff difficulty of the, of the case. But so you want to make sure the patient is well prepped and prepared for the procedure. Next slide. Let's talk about the surgical pitfalls of rectal cancer, and I'll end my presentation. Number one, you want to measure the distance with a rigid sigmoidoscope yourself so you can know exactly where the tumor is before treatment starts and after treatment. Plan for an ostomy. The patient has to be marked. That way, the ostomy is placed in the right position. If you're going to do a loop ostomy, prepare for dehydration issues and patient education. Um, review uh, images post chemo, re chemo radiation therapy because in the interval period, the patient can develop metastatic lesions. So you don't want to plan a big surgery with a patient with a stage four rectal cancer. Uh, place ureter stents. I think this is also very helpful to, to prevent ureter injuries. So for all my patients, I, I, I place the stents. You want to also plan for diversion after radiation because of the high risk of a leak. The key point here is watch your margins and watch the ureters. Next slide. Um, also, uh, don't underestimate the power of prehabilitation. I know we focus on rehab, but getting the patient optimized is crucial with nutrition, physical therapy, and ostomy education. And also plan for close follow-up, set clear expectations. Um, you know, you want to warn patients about the risk of sexual dysfunction, infertility after pelvic surgery. Um, also, uh, like I mentioned, ostomy education, ostomy education. Next slide. Any questions? We think we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Obahari. Uh, way to tackle a big topic in 10 minutes. Um, for your information, the Q&A section is coming after the next speaker. Without further ado, let's introduce, let me introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Jonathan Laria, who is a great mentor of mine. Professor Laria comes to us from the University of Arkansas of, for medical sciences, where he's a chief of the Division of Colorectal Surgery. Dr. Loria. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, my task is to talk about immunotherapy for colorectal cancer. Um, and I will run through the slides. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, I think we may have the wrong slide deck. Um, so. Um, there are three main molecular pathways um, of colorectal tumorigenesis. So we talk about the chromosomal instability pathway, which is typified by um, the um, FAP. Um, we have the mutator phenotype or the mismatch repair pathway, um, which we'll be talking about, and the hypermethylator phenotype pathway. Um, so next slide, please. Um, next slide. Next slide. Um, next slide. OK, so when we talk about the mismatch repair genes, there are four of them that are uh, used in clinical practice, um, HMLA1, sorry, MLH1, uh, ML MSH2, PMS2, and MSH6. Um, and these are the ones that are of clinical significance. There are other uh, mismatch repair genes. Next slide, please. Next slide. OK, so um, in, in talking about mismatch repair genes, what happens is that they form heterodimers that proofread um, the DNA strands during uh, DNA replication. So when a new strand is formed, um, these heterodimers will proofread um, the new strand and then make sure that if there are any um, errors in replication, these areas will be excised um, and then um, the errors will be corrected. 
So when the mismatch repair genes are mutated, um, we have what we call the deficient mismatch repair. Uh, and therefore you have errors that persist um, and lead to you know, increased um, tumor mutational burden. And so um, I think we have the wrong slide. Next slide. Okay, um, next slide. Okay, so when we talk about tumor mutational burden, we're talking about all the somatic mutations um, that are present in the tumor genome. And um, multiple studies have showed that, you know, the higher the tumor mutational burden, um, actually the better the progression-free or recurrence-free survival um, of patients as shown in this particular study. Next slide. So the, the deficient mismatch repair uh, system, as I said, is associated with a higher tumor mutational burden, and they are also associated with an increased immune surveillance. So in those um, cases, you know, we come to the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so pembrolizumab was probably the first one used um, in um, deficient mismatch repair um, cancers, you know, advanced cancers um, for colorectal cancer. And it was associated with longer progression-free survival when compared to uh, chemotherapy. And in this particular study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020, the median survival was 16.5 five months versus 8.2 months. Um, and next slide. Next slide. Um, next slide again, please. Next slide. Um, let's move to the next slide. Okay, I think we have the wrong deck of slides. Um, okay, next slide again. Okay, so, um, the uh, the issue is that we have these immune checkpoint inhibitors which um act on the pd1 or pdl1 um receptor ligands and and so when you use these um these agents um you are blocking the pd1 on the t cell or pdl1 on the tumor cell and what happens is that when once these are blocked then the um, antigen presenting cells on the tumor are able to be acted upon by the T cells so that the, um, the tumor can be destroyed. Now, um, tumors that have high tumor mutational burdens tend to have, um, to be more susceptible to these immune checkpoint inhibitors. And as we mentioned earlier, you know, tumors that are deficient in mismatch repair tend to have these high mutational burdens. And so um, this is where they have become useful. You know, one of the studies that was published um, last June was from Memorial Sloan Kettering. And this was a group of 12 patients with um, locally advanced um, color, um, rectal cancer. And these were treated with a single agent, dostalimab, uh, which is a PD-1 um, agent. And at the time of the publication of the paper, all 12 patients um, had no evidence of tumor and they had not received any chemo radiation. None of them had received um, surgery. And this is promising to be a game changer um, in the sense that patients who have rectal cancers or colorectal cancers that are um, deficient in mismatch repair, you know, then have another option um, of treatment, which may, um, as in the case of the last study that I mentioned, uh, which may actually um, prove to, um, to avoid surgery um, altogether. And so um, that's, that's really good. Now, um, coming to an, to an end, the other things that are in the pipeline are things like CAR T cells for colorectal cancer. There are studies that are looking um, at those. Um, there are also um, CAR N cells that are being trialed, as well as tumor vaccines that are being trialed. And so there are several things in the pipeline. 
Now, um, I've mentioned that tumors with deficient mismatch repair tend to have high tumor mutational burdens. There's also uh, the concept of tumors that have low mutational burdens, combining these immune checkpoint inhibitors with, um, with um, chemotherapy um, to effect um, killing of these tumors. And so there's a lot on the horizon when it comes to uh, immunotherapy for colorectal cancer. And I'll be happy to answer um, questions um, that may come up. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Laurier. Uh, glad to uh, have you um, all the way from West Africa uh, this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Laurier, one of his passion is um, teaching corridor surgery to West African surgeons. Um, so thank you for that talk. Uh, so let's bring everybody in. Great talks, guys. Great talks. Um, so in this Q&A session, uh, we'll start with uh, uh, the question on uh, screening guidelines. Uh, that's a very important topic. I know Dr. May touched up on it, um, but I have the first question. The first question goes to Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown, can you describe what is meant to be average risk and who are some of the high risk individuals for the audience listening? Dr. Brown, you may be muted. I apologize about that. I'm definitely on, I'm on call. Um, can you repeat your question, please? Yes. Uh, so the question is, um, uh, can you describe uh, what is meant to be average risk and who are some of the high risk individuals? So yeah, average risk is someone who has no family history of uh, colon cancer. Um, they um, are otherwise healthy, non-smokers, non-drinkers, people who um, otherwise, at baseline, are, are, are low risk, no rectal bleeding. Um, whereas higher risk individuals, from a medical standpoint, are those who would be folks who have Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, patients who have a, a first degree family member who have uh, who've had colon cancer um, and are within the screening age. And then, of course, there's the patients who, you know, are no longer you know, deemed people who are getting a screening colonoscopy or needing a screening colonoscopy. Um, those would be people who have rectal bleeding, weight loss, um, abdominal pain, changes in bowel habits that would prompt a diagnostic colonoscopy. And I believe we touched on that before as the difference between screening and diagnostic colonoscopy. Dr. Laria, um, what do you, you know, I, I have seen 85 year old who walk and, and talk like 60 year olds. Uh, we all see them come in our office. They look like they are going to live forever, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, what do you tell that 80 year old that walks and talks like a 60 year old and who asks you if he or she needs to continue to get colonoscopies? So when it comes to, um, to screening in the elderly um, population, there are a number of things that we have to take into account. Okay, number one, is it, is it someone who has screened since they were 50? I mean, now the, the screening age is now down to 45, but you know, in the past, have they been screening um, all the way up to that point? That's one. Secondly, what is the uh, expected life expectancy of such a person, right? So if you have someone who has screened, um, since they were 50, for example, and they've done their screening as it's supposed to be, um, then the general recommendation is that, you know, after age 75, they probably don't need to be screened um, anymore, right? Um, now you have, that is different from someone who has never screened before, they show up at age 75, do you treat them the same way, right? Again, you have to uh, make sure that the patient has at least eight to nine years of life expectancy for screening to be beneficial in that age group. And so um, we have to look at, uh, you know, again, their age, their functional status, look at, um, you know, their life expectancy, and then also um, look at whether they've been screened previously um, or not. So those are the things you take into account when you um, see an elderly patient um, who, presents for screening. 
Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. May, um, quick question. So the mistake young people make um, is that even with symptoms and not of screening age, that they do not need a colonoscopy. Can you share with some of our audience listening out there the difference between diagnostic and screening colonoscopy and why understanding the difference is very important? Yeah, I think this is a very important question and thank you for asking it because there's a misunderstanding, I think not just among patients, but also among physicians that that these symptoms do not need to be taken seriously. And that's because historically, colorectal cancer was an old male's disease, right? I mean, even when I was training in internal medicine not too long ago, uh, we used to teach people that this happened to people in their 70s and 80s. That is no longer the case. We're now seeing this disease. I'm diagnosing people in their 30s and 40s. So we need to change that narrative, not only among patients, but providers, that when patients are presenting with rectal bleeding, uh, changes in their bowel movements that have been sustained over time, pencil shapes, stools, that we need to take these symptoms seriously, even in a 30 or 40 year old. And we need to recommend that person for a diagnostic colonoscopy. And what I mean by that is when you're asymptomatic and we're doing screening, uh, we call those screening colonoscopies. But when you have symptoms and we're trying to look for what's causing those symptoms, we refer to that colonoscopy as a diagnostic colonoscopy. Yeah, great answer. Let me shift gears a little bit. Um, so this question is on question uh, on young people with colorectal cancer. Dr. Jenkins, you are doing great things down in Southern California. The data is suggesting that by 2030, the incidence of early age onset colorectal cancer diagnosis under age of 50 is predicted to be to increase by more than 140 percent, meaning more than 27,000 people under the age of 50 will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer. What advice do you have for young people? What I uh, advise for some young people, I think, is a generalized educating yourself and also learn to be your own advocate in your own home and also when you're dealing with your physicians. Number one, ask questions in your family. I feel like not enough patients or the young people ask about their family history. Asking your family, hey, did my grandparents, siblings, parents um, have any polyp history, colon cancer history? These are things that I don't feel are discussed enough in younger patients. Um, you often get patients who are 45, 50 who have some, oh yes, my uncle had colon cancer at this age or my mom, my grandfather, et cetera. So it's really important I tell my patients, please really ask your families what your history is. That's one. Number two, take control diet. Educate yourself about diet, nutrition, make changes. We know that colorectal cancer now in young patients is being caused usually by really poor diets, high processed foods. Unfortunately, a lot of the cheaper food is targeted towards patients and people of color because it's cheaper, because it's, it's, it's not as, you know, there's a stigma or this and this thought process that perhaps getting organic food or eating fruits and vegetables is too expensive. So we really need to take control of that narrative, help our patients, educate them about uh, nutrition while you too, that the need is you don't need organic, you just need more fiber, more fruits, more vegetables. Also, patients need to be their own advocates. If you have rectal bleeding and you're a young person, do not dismiss it. I will scope anybody who comes to my office who says, oh, doc, I have a hemorrhoid. What are your symptoms? I'm bleeding. You know, if you're a doctor, if you go see your doctor and they, you tell them you have rectal bleeding and they do not perform a rectal exam, you need to go see another doctor. You need to have this taken seriously. I will always perform a colonoscopy in a patient who has unusual symptoms and that I do not see any cause in the OR. I've caught early rectal cancers in people as young as 35, 36, because they have failed to advocate for themselves to get a colonoscopy. So if your provider is not listening to you, it's really important to find a provider who does, because sometimes we have to be our own advocates to get the care we want. 100%, 100%. Excellent, excellent comment there, uh, Dr. Jenkins. Since we're on the topic of rectal bleeding, Dr. Obari, you gave a nice talk on rectal cancer. And I was, that's the Mount Everest of colorectal surgery. Uh, rectal bleeding is one of the most important differential of red, red bleeding, frequently confused for hemorrhoids, because for everyone, everything is hemorrhoids, right? Yes. What do you suggest an individual does when there's rectal bleeding that would stop? Uh, when should they start to worry about bleeding and that would stop a week, a month, or what? What is it? Well, you know, just like, you know, that was mentioned by Dr. Jenkins so eloquently. Rectal cancer or cancer overall, colon cancer, 
most patients have no symptoms. Okay, let's start there. Most patients with colon cancer have no symptoms. So if you wait until you have symptoms, it's already too late. But if you have any symptoms like abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, or something that is just completely unusual from your normal, you want to get checked. Okay, because what we found out is that the sooner you get checked and the earlier with the diagnosis, the better the overall outcome. So for stage one rectal cancer, the, the five-year mortality is less than 5%. But when you go to stage three, stage four, that number goes up to about 80% in five years. So the point is, if we can catch it early and intervene early, um, it's, it's, it's very helpful. For my patients, anyone that comes to see me for rectal bleeding, I end up recommending a colonoscopy. And I kind of cancel them about it. Um, I start by treating the hemorrhoids if they have hemorrhoids. I do a rectal exam, I do an endoscopy in the office. But at the end of the day, in about a month or so after management of the bleeding of the hemorrhoids, they still get a colonoscopy. Um, in fact, the youngest patient I diagnosed with cancer was 18 years old with rectal bleeding. The second was about 23 years old. He came to see me for hemorrhoids, but he looked very pale. And I just the next day I told him we need to do a colonoscopy the very next day even before hemorrhoid surgery. Of course, he had um, stage three rectal cancer at, at, at the age of 23 years old. So the point here is early diagnosis is key and early management is key. That's quite a record there you have, uh, 18 years old. I don't think I've seen that young, but uh, that's just to show you how important this topic is. Let me shift gears. Um, we have some questions by the audience, but I have two more questions. So let's complete my questions and then we can jump right into the audience's questions um healthcare disparity question so dr may uh you're doing a lot of good work um in the healthcare disparity space i uh, amazing research eight million dollar grant all of that um so what do you think is causing such a disparity in colorectal cancer treatment yeah so the disparities in colorectal cancer screening are multifactorial um, what, what I mean by that is that there are reasons that it come from everything from the patient level, the provider level, the health system level, and policy level. So particularly in this country, not until very recently did we have policy coverage for preventive services, and that left certain groups at a disadvantage and underscreened um, and in poor health outcomes. We also know that there is more hesitancy about seeking primary care, about seeking preventive care, about seeking colonoscopy and ethnic racial minorities, particularly black males. There are several studies that show there's quite a bit of hesitancy about having an invasive procedure in this particular part of the body, which is why I always emphasize that there are other ways to get screened if colonoscopy is not desired. In addition, there are provider factors, let's be honest. There are, there's, there's frank, um, um, unintentional sometimes discrimination in our healthcare system. And there are studies done by our group and others that show that providers, whether they're white or black, are less likely to recommend screening to black patients. So I don't blame it all on patients. I think that there's a lot that we need to do on the policy level, um, how we provide care for patients in healthcare systems, but also educating patients about the importance and about the fact that they're highest risk. Good. Uh, Dr. Brown, um, you know, Particularly, I think she mentioned a little bit about this. Black males notoriously get screened the least, right? Right. He's driving that. Well, I think um, when you look at some of the literature that Dr. May is referencing, when you equalize access to care, the um, rates of uh, detecting and preventing colon cancer are are, are minimized um, between racial populations. Um, so there's an access issue, of course. And then I think there's stigmatization against uh, having this procedure performed, as uh, she indicated. Having sensitive exams like this um, are are not um, you know, are generally frowned upon and, and and may you know attract unwarranted attention. They believe. The other thing that I like to point out is um, I think there's a one uh, men want to uh, don't want to take time off of work to potentially have this particular. Uh, tests done, and then two, they underestimate their risk of having um, 
the disease or what their risk factors are. Um, and so those two combined lead us to delaying care and delaying care until it may be too late. That bleeding, that's a hemorrhoid, I don't have any problems. Let me go to work so I can continue providing for our family, et cetera. However, you know, un untangling that, uh, those socioeconomic issues from the individual's health may be uh, very difficult. Great. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so the public question, the polyp question, I like this question uh, because a lot of people don't know what a polyp really is. Dr. May, this is a two part question. What is a polyp? That's one. And the other question is, we just heard Dr. Larry uh, give an excellent talk on cancer genetics and does having abnormal polyps in a first degree relative put one at risk, at same risk as having cancer in a first degree relative? Um, yes. Yeah, go ahead. So a polyp is a precursor or, uh, to a colorectal cancer. All colorectal cancers um, come from colorectal polyps. Now polyps are like a bump. They look like a bump or a pimple they grow on the lining of the colon and we're able to visualize them when we're doing a procedure like a colonoscopy. Um, most polyps are benign, meaning that they're not gonna do anything, but a small percentage of them over, uh, over time, years and years and years, can slowly uh, progress to a colorectal cancer. So when we're screening, what we're doing is we're trying to find these polyps and take them out before they have the chance to progress into a colorectal cancer. Individuals who have a family member who has grown the adenomatous type of polyp, which is the higher risk type of polyp, are at increased risk of developing colorectal cancer in themselves. And this is why we do ask people with their family history, not only is there a family history of colorectal cancer, but is there a family history of colorectal polyps or specifically tubular adenomatous polyps? Because of those people, we might we actually will screen starting at age forty at age forty instead of forty five. So not as high as a risk as someone um, in brother, mother, sister, father who's had colon cancer, but certainly elevates your risk. Dr. Laria, you the genetics guy. Any take on that? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, I, I agree with Dr. May. Um, you know, in the sense that. Yes, having, you know, first degree relatives with high risk adenomas, you know, puts you at, at risk. However, it's not it's not to the level of having the first, you know, first degree relative. When we talk about first degree relative, like she mentioned, is, you know, either a parent, um, a sibling or a child. Um, so that's what we're talking about. And especially if the um, the relative had colorectal cancer at a younger age then it becomes even uh, more important. Um, you know, in general, if you have um, a relative who had colorectal cancer in their 80s, you know, then you are considered more like average risk um, person. However, you know, the younger they were, um, the, the, the higher the risk um, to you as an individual. All right, so we're gonna start fielding questions from the audience. Um, and I do not have the questions uh, in front of me, but um, we have uh, producers in the back there. Okay, so the first one um, says, "If I sorry if I missed this, President, but there is a strong working hypothesis yet as to why this increases colorectal cancer in younger patients. I agree with that. Um, <laughs> while we while we fill the questions in, well, I can, I can take a stab at that question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, just like the so, there's an increased risk in younger patients, and when you look at colon cancer or cancer in general, there are two major factors that cause colon, that cause cancer: environmental and genetics. I call it the zip code and the genetic code. Now, our genetic code hasn't changed much in the last. 100 years. However, our zip code has changed, which means where we live and what we do where we live. So for example, eating a lot of processed foods, processed meats, like Dr. May mentioned earlier, has a strong impact on our increased risk for colon cancer. There's increased free radicals in the, in the colon 
due to prolonged transit times, due to the foods that we eat. There are increased toxins in the food, in the environment. And I think that is one of the major drivers. About five to 10 years ago, um, there was a publication, publication that came out talking about the risk of eating processed meats that is just as bad for you as smoking, okay? Uh, those are things that we need to really explain to our patients. Um, high fiber foods, like Dr. Jenkins mentioned, I think is crucial to fighting this battle. I agree with you. I cannot agree with you more, um, Dr. Bohari. All you have to do is just go to the uh, grocery store. There's 8,000 um, processed foods in the cold storages, and um, and all those processes uh, that were used to preserve these foods, you have to kind of wonder what's in them. And uh, there's no better topic when a patient comes to you in the office and you know that this person does not understand the concept of, of reducing um, grilled meats and barbecued meats. And those are all usually most of the wonderful conversations that I have with my patients. So, um, well, uh, is there any other question? If there's no other question, um, we can uh, proceed. Oh. Yeah, Dr. Larry, you have a, you have a, a statement? Yeah, so, yeah, I think there were some questions. Um, you know, talking about um, immunotherapy and whether um, this was uh, available in developing countries. Um, then there was uh, another question on whether we use tumor mutational burden to uh, determine who receives immunotherapy or is MSI status adequate? And I think I, I'll take a stab at those yeah, uh, sure. Go questions. Ahead. So in terms of what we use for determining immunotherapy, really is the MSI status or the uh, mismatch repair status. So they have to be deficient mismatch repair or MSI high um, to, um, to respond to these checkpoint, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, tumors that have low tumor mutational burden um, tend not to respond to these agents. And so, the question, uh, this also comes to that question, do you use the tumor mutational burden or not? Um, right now, that is not what is being used in clinical practice, uh, is the MSI status. But um, I think there are groups that are working on developing that as an assay um, that can be used to determine um, whether or not you know, we give immunotherapy. Now, in terms of whether these, um, immune checkpoint inhibitors are available in low middle, middle income countries. I think some of them are, but obviously the, um, the cost um, tends to be quite prohibitive. And so only a few people can afford them. Um, but that um, the availability, I know, at least I know in some countries like Nigeria and Ghana, they are available. Thanks for that. I'm being told that we, uh... I uh, need to wrap it up. Um, so those are very useful discussions, guys. I wish we have more time. Obviously, we can stay here and talk forever. Um, but I believe we've learned so many things in this today's webinar. Uh, so let me quickly summarize. Um, and I was, like I said, I'm, I'm from, I'm in Kansas City, Missouri, in the heartland. And um, I'm the director of rectal cancer program here at the, the St. Louis Health System. Next slide, please. So look around you this year, one in 23 men and one in 25 women will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer. One in 10 colorectal cancers are diagnosed in patients under the age of 50. And it's very preventable cancer if we screen for it. 60% of colorectal cancer is preventable through screening. Black Americans are 20% more likely to get colorectal cancer and 40% more likely to die from the disease than other groups. You now know that it is a fact that colorectal cancer can occur in young patients. You've heard it today. By 2030, the incidence of colorectal, early onset colorectal cancer under the age of 50 is predicted to increase by 140%. By 2030, colorectal cancer is estimated to be the leading cause of cancer death for 20 to 49 years of age. Clinicians have to do a better job. Let's face it, educating the public about colorectal cancer. When a person has symptoms, that individual should proceed with colonoscopy. That individual need not to wait until 45 years of age to do colonoscopy. Everything is not hemorrhoids. Any rectal bleeding lasting more than one month should be evaluated by a doctor. If a family member has polyps, 
you may also be at risk of colorectal cancer. So don't forget to ask your family members about polyps after their colonoscopy. It is official. All insurances cover screening colonoscopy so long as it is recommended by your doctor. So there are no excuses. Um, you can follow us as, uh, at, the, um, at the Twitter at ICHUS. Um, and thank you again to our in incredible speakers for educating us on colorectal cancer. Dr. Fowler May, Dr. Laria, Dr. Bohari, Dr. Brown, and Dr. Jenkins. We appreciate our fantastic audience for staying with us throughout the show. A huge thanks to the production team for putting these slides together. Stay tuned. Uh, our next webinar will be May 20th, 2023, on some important topics on surgical oncology. I am your host, Dr. Robert Amajoy, the Chair of Corridor Surgery for International Corridor Surgeons and the Executive Producer of the 60 Minute Webinar Series. Until next time.